Hello, in this video we're going to be studying minimums and maximums. Now if you haven't already, please pause this video and go watch the motivational video here. Uh, it's a video of Sal Khan giving a quick overview of minimums and maximums. It's quite well done and it will give you an overall view of what we're looking at in this section. It's nice to sometimes get a bird's eye view of the topic before you dive in to the details. So hopefully you've watched that, and we're going to take a look at a few different definitions. It's important in mathematics to give clear, precise definitions, because without definitions, we might not be agreeing on what we're talking about. We might not all be meaning the same thing when we say something. And so I know you know what an increasing or a decreasing or a constant graph look like. You could graph something that looks increasing or something that looks decreasing, but... How would you know that it's increasing? How would you define something to be increasing? If you say goes up, well, which, which way is up? What do you mean goes? Those words are vague, and we need to be specific in math. So we're going to introduce this symbol. Uh, it's an upside-down A, and it means for all. So it's a, it's a useful term in math. Sometimes we just write for all, but this is shorthand, uh, which means for all. So here's the definition of an increasing function. So let's let fx be a function defined on some interval i, any interval we want, and let's suppose that x1 and x2 are two numbers in the interval. So we're going to take two numbers there. If f of x1 is less than f of x2, whenever x1 is less than x2, for all x1 and x2, e again means element of, so for all x1 and x2 in the interval i, then f is increasing on i. Let's take a look at what we mean in a diagram here. So we have a graph. I think we would all agree that this graph is clearly increasing. But how do we know? Well, let's pick an x1 and x2. So here we have x1, and here we have x2. Now, the way we pick x1 and x2 is that x1 has to be less than x2. So that means x1 has to be here. This means x1 is left of x2. It's on the left-hand side, which makes sense. When you pick points, they come in order. There's the first point and then the second point. So x1 is less than x2. Now, we want to look at f of x. f of x means the y values. So let's draw that on the graph as well. Over here, this would be f of x1. And over here, at about 1, this would be f of x2. Now look at those two y values. Which one is greater? Which one is further up the y-axis? Clearly, f of x2 is greater than f of x1. And so as long as this is always happening, wherever you pick your points, maybe you picked your point here and here, or maybe you picked your point here and here, whenever you pick two points, in fact, for all points, x1 and x2, as long as you get this relationship, where f of x1 is lower and f of x2 is higher, then we can say overall that the function is increasing on the interval. Now, how do you think you'd define a decreasing function? Well, let's take a look. If f of x1 is less than f of x2, whenever x1 is less than x2, for all x1, x2 in the interval i, then f is decreasing on i. So notice the only difference in the two definitions is this portion right here. We flip around the f of x1 and f of x2 inequality. Which, again, should make sense. Let's label our x1. So here's x1. Here's x2. x2 is right on the axis. And over here, we've got f of x1. And over here, we've got f of x2. So, if we look, is x1 to the left of x2? Does it go x1 first and then x2 second? Well, definitely. And in this case f of x2 is smaller, right? You can see there's f of x1 and then below it is f of x2. This one is smaller than that one. As you move along the graph, you're getting lower. And so indeed, this function, it looks like it's clearly decreasing and it fits the definition that we've provided here. So time for a quick clicker question. Which function is de decreasing on the interval i? In this case, the interval is the entire interval shown. So is it a, b, c, or d? Go ahead and pause the video and give it your best shot. All right, hopefully you've given it a try. Let's look at the answer. Well, I don't think it's going to be C. I'm, I don't think it's... 
option C because this graph actually looks like it's clearly increasing. Now graph A and B are tempting. A is decreasing on this portion, but then it's increasing on this portion. So graph A is not increasing or decreasing, at least on the interval shown, it's, it's doing both, which means it's not doing either. It's not clearly increasing or clearly decreasing, which means B gets rooted out as well. It goes up first, but then goes down after. And so it's not purely decreasing. But the graph D is definitely decreasing on the whole interval. So the answer would be D. Now there's one more definition, a constant function. So if f of x1 is equal to f of x2, whenever x1 is less than x2, for all x1 and x2 in the interval i, then f is constant on i. So if we look at this function here we have, it's just going along. We could say here this is our x1. This is our x2. And we notice that f of x1 is equal to f of x2. So whenever you pick two points, if the function has the same y value, then we say that function is constant on the interval. So let's go ahead and identify some intervals of increasing and decreasing and constant on the following graph. So where do you think the graph is increasing? Or where do you think it's decreasing? Where do you think it's maybe constant? Well, let's look at the first portion here. It looks like it's going, it looks like it's going up. It feels like this part would be increasing. And indeed, if you look, whenever you pick two points, the y value goes higher on the right point than it is on the left. So increasing. Definitely from negative four to three, negative three. And we're always gonna use round brackets when we talk about increasing and decreasing because it's not really fair to say it's at the very top of it, it's still increasing. At the very top of it, it's actually gonna turn around and become decreasing. So we don't include that endpoint. We just go up to negative three, but we don't include it. Let's look to see if we can find another portion where it's increasing. This looks decreasing. Oh, this looks increasing. Oh, and then this looks like it's constant. So let's go ahead and looks like right there, maybe at negative 1.5. And then looks like right over here at 1.5. So we'll union those on, union negative 1.5 to 1.5. It's increasing on that interval as well. Now where is it decreasing? Well, we already talked about that. It was decreasing right here. So we would say it is decreasing on the interval negative 3 to negative 1.5. And where is it constant? Well, again, we mentioned that already. It's right over here. So it is constant from 1.5 right till the end at 3. But again, we are not going to include the endpoints on these. Now, if we look at a graph like this, it seems like there might be a place where it's as big as possible. And it's important in math to find locations where a graph might be as big as possible. You can think about uh, on the planet Earth, where is the, the tallest place you know, the, the highest point, well, of course, would be Mount Everest. This would be the absolute maximum of the Earth's surface, and it's interesting. People go climb Mount Everest just because it's the tallest thing around. And in math, we want to give something like that a special name. When something is the highest or the absolute, we're going to call it the absolute maximum or the global maximum, or sometimes we just call it the max. Mathematicians sometimes like to give the same thing a few different names, maybe it has some flavor. Uh, try to keep it not quite as dry, and so we could call it the absolute maximum, or global maximum, or just the max. Now here's the definition. A function f has an absolute maximum at a point c if f of c is greater than or equal to f of x, for all x in D, where D is the domain of f. Again, here's that symbol for all. It means for every single x value that you can take from the domain, then as long as f of c is the biggest y value around, f of c is called the absolute maximum. So the number f of c, the y value, is called the maximum value of f on D. Again, another thing that you might have heard of is the absolute minimum. Uh, when you're studying chemistry and temperature, you might want to know the absolute minimum temperature, absolute zero, right? Of course, a zero Kelvin or a hundred, or sorry, it's a, uh, negative 273 Celsius. So this absolute minimum or global minimum, or sometimes called the minimum, or just the min, is the same definition as the absolute maximum, 
but we flip the sign around. So we have an absolute minimum if we have some y value, f of c, that's less than or equal to f of x for all x in the domain. So if you find the smallest y value, it's smaller than all other y values, that y value is called the minimum value of f on the domain d. Now I'm just going to sketch some graphs for you here to make sure you really understand what a minimum and maximum would be. So let's look at our good friend, the parabola. Do you think the parabola has a maximum? Well, if you look at it, does it ever have a highest value? If you look at the range of the parabola, let's say this is y equals x squared, the range would be from 0 to infinity. And the fact that we have infinity as the range means there is no largest value. The range continues on and on. So this graph would have no max, no maximum. It has no absolute maximum. It never gets to the top. This graph goes on and on. But it definitely has a minimum right here, the minimum, or the absolute minimum, if you want to say the absolute. The absolute minimum would be y equal to 0, which you can see over here in the range. So it would have an absolute minimum, but it wouldn't have an absolute maximum. Now, let's think about a graph that might have neither. Well, what if we took our good friend, the line, y equals x? Does this graph have a maximum? No, it just continues on and on forever. A minimum? No. So this is no max, no min. Hmm. What else what might we get? Could we have a graph that has, has maybe multiple maximums, multiple minimums? Let's take a look. What if we drew maybe y equal to sine x? Well, it would go up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down forever. And so this graph would actually have multiple places where we have the absolute maximum. All of these, all of these places would be the max. And it would have multiple places where you have the minimum. All of these places would be the minimum. Now it's important to note that the minimum number, the minimum number is negative one. And the maximum number, the maximum number is positive one. It's not as though there's different values for the maximum. No, the maximum is the maximum. It's the maximum value you can get. But the maximum value happens multiple times. Now, do you think the maximum and minimum could ever be the same value? Well, surely not, but what if you had y equals to, let's say, 3? A simple constant function. That's not the best straight line. Let's try again. If it was just y equals to 3, it's just a perfectly flat horizontal line. Well, in this case, the constant graph, everything, Everything along here is all the maximum. Every single place is happening all the time. And the minimum, well, these are clearly the smallest values too. And so the constant function is kind of weird because on a constant function, the max is 3 and the min is also 3. And they both happen everywhere all the time. Constant graphs are kind of boring. We don't tend to study them, but just as an interesting consequence of our definition, this graph would be always the maximum and always the minimum. It's always both, which is a little bit weird. So as a remark, the maximum or minimum value is also referred to as the extreme values of f on an interval or on a domain d. A function f may take on the maximum or minimum more than once, on your given domain. So we may have multiple times with the extreme value. And this is the example we were looking at before. Here we have y equals to sine x, and the domain is 0 to 3 pi. So let's go ahead and find the maximum. It looks like we've got one there, and we've got the same value there. So these are both the max. And if we look for the minimum, well, it looks like right there, the min. So clearly we can have the maximum happening at two places. Uh, this graph along the axis looks a little bit funny, but this point right here would be at 
do that in another color. This point here would be at pi by 2 and 1. And then the minimum over here would be at 3 pi by 2 and negative 1. Now think for yourself, where would the maximum be here? Clearly, the y value would be 1 again. But what would the x value be? Well, it's actually 2 pi further than the initial pi by 2, which makes it 5 pi by 2. 5 pi by 2. Okay, so what is a local or relative maximum? Hmm. Well, this is going to be an important topic that's going to come up in calculus. This idea of a local or relative maximum. So let's look at the definition and then a graph. A function f has a local or relative maximum at c if there exists an open interval a, b containing c such that f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for all x in the interval a to b. Now I know there's a lot there, but we're going to break it down. So it's going to have a local or relative maximum if there exists an open interval. The key is that there's going to be some open interval. Let's look at this graph here. Does it look like there's a maximum there? I think so. It looks like the top of a hill. So the key is you have to draw yourself an interval, a little open interval. Call this A and B. Now inside this interval, as long as you can look at that maximum point right here, this is going to contain the value C. And as long as at that point, f of c is greater than or equal to f of x, as long as f of c is the highest y value in comparison to everything around, then f of c is going to be the relative maximum. It might not be the absolute maximum. What if this graph continued on like this and it was a cubic? Well, this big graph would have no absolute maximum. For our purposes right now, and this is why it's going to be so important, we're not worried about whether it has an absolute maximum. We're just looking at this small interval here and saying that the graph definitely has a local or a relative maximum. So the definition of a local or relative minimum is very similar. We just go ahead and switch the direction of the inequality. So instead of f of c being greater than or equal to f of x, f of c is less than or equal to f of x. So if we look at our picture here, Clearly, it looks like we have a little valley, and it looks like this point right here is the smallest point around. It looks like it's the minimum. But again, it might not be the absolute minimum. What if this graph went on like this and did something weird over here? This over here might be the min. This might be the absolute minimum over here. But that's not important because we're looking for a small little interval, a little interval A to B. And in this interval, this is the smallest point around. It doesn't matter if the graph does something else over here. We're just looking at an open interval containing the point. So here, this is going to be our point C. And clearly, f of C is less than or equal to f of x. It's the smallest y value around. So let's take a look at a Plicker question. Where do the extreme values of the function occur? So again, extreme values here, this means absolute maximum or absolute minimum. Where are the extreme values occurring? So I'll give you a second, give it a look. Okay, well, there's going to be, right here, the minimum, or the absolute minimum. And over here, we're going to have the max, and we're also going to have Another place where that maximum value occurs right here, the max. So we want to look at the x values because it asks where do they occur. I would agree that the maximum value is equal to 1 and the minimum value is equal to 0. But those are y values. You would say here the minimum value is y equal to 0 or the maximum value is y equal to 1. If we're talking about x values, well, the x values happen at minus 2, at 0, and at 2. So the correct answer here would be C. All right, here's a good question. Is x equal to 2 a local minimum? Is x equal to 2 a local minimum? Pause the video and think about it for a bit. Does this point at 2 fit the definition? 
All right, well, maybe you put maybe. Maybe you're not sure, but is this a local minimum? Let's look right here. Now, I would agree that this point C is the minimum. I agree that of all the points that I've shown you on this graph, C is clearly the minimum, but they're not asking about the min. They're asking, is it a local minimum? And to be a local minimum, what you always want to look for is a little interval, AB. Wait a minute. We can't draw an interval over here because the graph ends right at C. And so there's a very important takeaway from this. This point C is not a local minimum. It is not a local minimum because we can't draw a little interval around it. In particular, the end point of a graph can never be a local minimum or maximum. The end points could be absolute maximums for sure, but they can't be local because there's no little interval to draw around the point. So this is not a local minimum. Now let's try to identify all the local minimums and maximums and absolute minimums and absolute maximums of this graph. So go ahead and give this a sketch. Here we have a little graph. And let's try to identify the points. So in red, I'm going to go through these for the maximums. Right here, we've clearly got a little interval. So this is going to be a local max. Local max. And over here, we've got another little interval. So this will be a local max. Now, at the very end here, I can't draw a little interval because it's an endpoint. So this will not be a local maximum but it will be the maximum, or the max. All right, in blue, let's look for minimums. Well, there's a little valley here, and there's a little interval around it, so this will be a local minimum. And over here, we've got a little valley. That'll also be a local minimum. But now, if we look around the graph, this point here is the smallest point overall which means it's not just a local minimum, it is also, also the minimum, or the global minimum, or the absolute minimum. Now let's do an example with some algebra. Let's let fx equal 4x minus 1, where x is on the interval 0 to 2. Let's find the global and local extrema, so global and local, maximum, and minimums. Now, to start this question, we actually are going to need to draw a graph. So I'm going to put a little axis here. If I plug in 0, the 1 endpoint, I'll get absolute value of 0 minus 1, which is absolute value of negative 1, which is 1. So I'll put that right there. Now, if I plug in the other endpoint, 2, I'll get absolute value of, well, 2 times 4 is 8, minus 1, absolute value of 7, which is 7. So over at 2, not quite the scale here, 2 and 7, and this over here is 0 and 1. Now I need to find a way to graph this, and in particular, you should remember that absolute value graphs tend to look like Vs, at least when the inside is linear. And so we should set 4x minus 1 equal to 0 to find the inside part of the v, to find the pointy part where it hits the axis. So 4x equals to 1, so x equals to 1 over 4. So right over here, when x is a quarter, we're going to have y equaling to 0. So we can graph something that looks like a little check mark which means we have all the information we need. The max is clearly happening at 2 and 7. So that's where the maximum is occurring. It occurs at 2 and it has a value of 7. The min, well the minimum value is happening at a quarter and the value is 0. Now, are either one of those local? We found the absolute maximum, the absolute minimum, but are any of them local? The one over at 2, 7 doesn't look like I could draw an interval around that because it's an endpoint. But over at the point a quarter and uh, 
Zero, I definitely could. It's not a smooth point at the bottom, but that doesn't matter it being smooth or not, as long as you have an interval. And so we do have a local minimum. We have a local minimum at the same, one quarter and zero. Let's do another example. Let's let f of x equal four minus x squared when x is between negative two and zero, and 2x minus 1 when x is between 0 and 2. Let's find the global and local extrema, the maximums and minimums. So again, a graph would be helpful in this case. So let's take a look. Over at negative 2 to 0, we have this portion, which you should recognize as a parabola because of x squared. Uh, it's going to be opening down, and the vertex is over at 4. Now, we actually can't plot the vertex here, unfortunately, because when x equals to 0, it switches to the other portion of the piecewise function. But you can still draw the vertex as a point of discontinuity. So if we were to label this 1, 2, 3, 4, this is going to be the top of the parabola as a whole. And then the parabola opens down, so we'll go like this. We could actually figure that point out here. If we plug in x equal to negative 2, 4 subtract negative 2 squared, or 4 subtract 4 will be 0. So this point over here is going to be 1, 2. So we could put that on the graph here. So we've got the left half of a parabola. The right half of this piecewise function is 2x minus 1, so clearly a line. Uh, it's got a slope of 2, and it's got a y-intercept down here at negative 1. So we can put that on the graph. y-intercept of negative 1. And then it continues on up. How high does it go? Well, it goes till x is equal to 2. 2 times 2 is 4, minus 1 is 3. So we should put that here. 1, 2. And it goes to 3. Oh, let's try that again. There's our graph. So a weird graph, definitely, because it's a piecewise function. It comes in pieces. We have the parabola piece here and then the line piece here. Now let's try to figure out if we have any absolute maximums, absolute minimums, local maximums, local minimums. It looks like the minimum is actually easiest to find. Let's look right here. This point here is clearly going to be the minimum. So the min is happening at, well, 0 and negative 1. Now here's a question. Is that minimum a local minimum? What do you think? Some of you might be tempted to say, well, no, no, it, it doesn't look like a little valley. But this is why definitions are so crucial. Because you think that a local minimum has to look like a valley. But that's not what the definition says. All you need to do is draw yourself a little interval around that point, which we can do. It's a weird looking interval for sure, but there's our interval. And is this point smaller than all the other points in the interval? Is this y value the smallest? Well, it's definitely the smallest of the ones on the right side, and it's way smaller than the y values on the left side. So this is also, also a local minimum which is why, again, the definitions are so key, because without a proper definition, you're going to begin to argue of whether or not this is or isn't a local minimum. You might argue that it's not because it doesn't look like a uh, nice little valley, or you might argue that it is because, well, it's the smallest of all the points around, and without a concrete definition, there's no way to settle the argument. But with the definition, we can say very confidently we have a local minimum. Weird one for sure, but definitely a local minimum. Now, what about a maximum? Hmm. Well, there's a point here that looks high, but it's not a local maximum because there's no interval. Um, this, this isn't the highest point because this is 3, and it's definitely hitting 3.5, 3.8, 3.9. But is there a highest point? Well, suppose there was, maybe 3.9. I bet I could find a higher point, 3.99. Maybe you could find a higher point, 3.999. And I think we could play that game all day long. In fact, because of this hole here, you can keep getting larger and larger and larger. You'll never get to four, but you can get closer and closer and closer. Now you might say, okay, well, four is the maximum. 
but the graph never takes on the value 4. Because when x is equal to 0, it's not looking at this portion. I agree if you take 0 and plug it in or do some kind of limit thing, but we're not looking at limits right now. We're just trying to find the absolute value. And when x is equal to 0, that portion has to go down here. And you get 2 times 0 minus 1, which is negative 1. And so this graph, it's actually very surprising, has no maximum. No maximum. Or you could say the max, another way of saying this, the max does not exist. Now, just for a bit of an aside here, this is not part of the course, but if you were wondering about that idea of, of a limit, you might say, okay, there is no maximum, but if I was to pick one, I would pick four. So four is kind of max, right? Kind of max. It's not max, and again, this is not part of the course, but when I say it's kind of the max, you could say that the four is four is what the maximum should have been. It's, it's the largest value that is there without being there. And so this actually leads to what's called a supremum uh, in mathematics. You'll study it in future courses. Four is, is not the maximum because it never hits the value four. Uh, but four is called the supremum. It's uh, what's termed as the least upper bound. It's the value that you would get from a limit. If you were to limit this graph, you would get the value four. Uh, but we're not doing that in this course. And so for our purposes, this graph has no maximum. There is not a maximum. So let's take a look at this clicker question. What is the maximum of this function? Negative two, two, four, one. Pause the video and give it a try yourself. So hopefully you gave it a try. Clearly we can see right here. This is the max. And when you're asked for the maximum, they mean the y value. So, 4. If you're asked where it occurs, it occurs at x equals to negative 2. But the value, the actual maximum value of the function is 4. Now we need to look at an important theorem involving the minimums and maximums, and it's called the extreme value theorem. Now we're not going to prove this. There's no proof for the extreme value theorem. And in fact, the proof requires that supremum idea that I mentioned we're not going to be talking about in this course. So if we don't talk about supremums, how could we talk about the proof of this? But trust me, you can prove it. It's a very interesting proof, uh, and you'll look at it later on in your mathematics career. But for now, we're going to take it on faith, the extreme value theorem. So what does it say? Well, let fx be a continuous function on AB. So we have to have a continuous function. Uh, clearly in our last example it was not continuous, so that's partly why it failed. But if we have a continuous function on a closed interval AB, then the extreme value theorem says that f takes on the maximum and the minimum value at least once on AB. So what that means is, as long as you're looking at a continuous function on a closed interval, you're always going to have a maximum and minimum value. The maximum and minimum will always exist. Let's look at an example here. Well, clearly right here, we have the max. And clearly right over here, we have the min. Now, this doesn't prove the theorem, but it shows you an example of where it's true. And indeed, a continuous function seems good, seems reasonable. In our previous example that we had, I'll redraw it here for you. It looked like this. This function, unfortunately, because of this point here, was not continuous. And so, as long as your function is continuous, then you always get a maximum and minimum. And this should feel reasonable. Again, imagine try drawing a graph where this wouldn't happen. So, let's see over here. Imagine trying to draw a graph. Well, you're going to start here, and then you're going to go down and up. And Well, it has to be connected, and you have to stop somewhere and end somewhere, and so, well, what are you going to get? You're going to get a maximum, maybe over here. Maybe you're going to get a minimum over here. But however you try to draw the graph, you're going to have a maximum and minimum. There's no way around it. It just it seems so true. It seems like it has to be true. That's because it's a theorem. It is true. You always get a maximum and minimum from continuous functions. Now, let's go a little further with the logic. Clearly, 
The maximum must occur either at the endpoints or on the interior. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the endpoints means literally at the points on the end, and the interior means everything else. Now, this isn't a huge logical leap, but again, I'll explain it for you. If you have a maximum value, because the extreme value theorem says you have a maximum, either that maximum has to happen at one of the two points on the end, or somewhere in the middle. Because the two points on the end, plus all the points in the middle, equal all the points on the graph. So all we're saying here is the um, maybe not so profound insight that the maximum value happens either at the ends, so on this graph, the minimum here happens at the end, maximum and minimum, either one. Uh, in this case, the maximum happens in the middle. Here we have a minimum and maximum both happening in the middle. Here they're all happening in the middle, but it's just saying that happens either at the end or somewhere in the middle. Okay, well what's so important about that? Well, let's look at these two graphs here where we don't have maximums and minimums. So, so in this graph here, it looks like we have a minimum value over here, but there's no maximum because of that weird hole there. That's really a problem because the graph isn't continuous. And on this graph here, it looks like there's no maximum as you go up, and also no minimum on this side. This problem on this graph here is not continuity, it is continuous, but this is not a closed interval. Because of the asymptote here, the domain, if you were to write the domain for this, would only be 0 to 2, and there would be round brackets. And so we don't have a closed interval, we have open interval, we have round brackets, and so that's what causes the problem here. But as long as you don't have continuity issues or you don't have interval issues, we're going to have this minimum and maximum happening somewhere on the inside or at the endpoints. Now, here's the real crux of the issue. How can we check everything? We could check the endpoints relatively easily, right? There's only two of them, the left and the right. But how could we avoid checking every single point on the interior? How could we avoid checking all 100,000, well actually there's an infinite number of points. This doesn't really help us. If we're trying to find the maximum and minimum value of a function, if that's what we're looking for, well, checking the endpoints of course is a good idea, but if you have to check everywhere in the middle, just because you know there's going to be a maximum doesn't mean you know how to find it. And checking every point doesn't seem like a good idea. So I wonder if there's some way, is there some insight, is there some way to narrow this down so we don't have to check every single point? Well, in fact, if we look at a picture, on this graph here, this might not be the maximum, but it's certainly a local maximum. And this might not be the minimum, but it's certainly a local minimum. And what do you notice about that local maximum? Well, the tangent line is horizontal. And what do you notice about this local minimum? The tangent line is horizontal. So it appears that maximum and minimum points are going to happen where the tangent lines are horizontal. And there's not going to be an infinite number of points where the tangent line is horizontal. It might only be horizontal a few times. And so this idea here, which we're going to look at in more depth, is going to help us narrow down where these maximum and minimum points are. Now that's all we have for today. We're going to look at it in more depth tomorrow. Uh, but for now, you can take a look at the homework on page 283 to get yourself familiar with these ideas of minimums and maximums. Thanks for watching.